But in the words of Kenny Everett, now for something completely different. Um, we, normally, we normally have a lecture uh, about something, quite often about the Second World War, recently about the Napoleonic Wars. I'm glad to say this evening we have a lecture which continues the trend because we're still fighting the French. Um, and um, David Fawcett is going to talk to us about the medieval sniper and the use of longbows and crossbows. Um, I've heard David talk before. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Uh, and uh, do be prepared to ask questions as you go along. Uh, and at the end, uh, I'm sure they won't mind. If you want to have your photograph taken wearing a bit of medieval armour, uh, I'm sure they will be delighted. Thank you very much for coming along. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. I don't know if you'll be doing it when I finish. <laughs> <laughs> but I noticed a few regimental ties, and as you will have uh, read on the, uh, the the introductory paperwork, you got. I was a military policeman. And this is about the first time I've stood up in front of people with accent and tears, and not have bananas and monkey nuts thrown in my head. <laughs> <laughs> so either people have mellowed or uh, the cost of food so much these days. As with by the introduction, I have been involved in medieval reenactment and talks for 30 odd years or so. Uh, I've done a number of courses and I've uh, worked for English Heritage, uh, National Trust, <coughs> and uh, places like the uh, Broadchalk, the Festival of History there, and uh, the ones <coughs> that they used to have in Kelmarsh. People say, are you an expert? The answer is no, because if you know the definition of an expert, X is a has-been and a spurt's a drip under pressure. <laughs> so then again, I might be an expert in that respect. What I'm going to talk to you today, and hopefully not for too long, because it would be nice for people to handle some of the gear and bits and pieces, is about what we'll call the medieval sniper. If you read history books, you won't see that a topic brought up in, in, in that language. But if you look at what happened in history, you'll find that things did occur which tends to suggest people were skilled enough to use a particular weapon in a way which would equate to the infantryman or whoever sniping at, at, uh, at a given target today. And the two categories which are, I think, uh, lend themselves, certainly as far as the armies for these isles are, are the longbow and the crossbow. So what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about both, have a chat how they were used, uh, how they came to being, and uh, the, the occasions when they could be used for sniping. First of all, we'll go for the longbow. In medieval England, there were lots and lots of bows, but this came into being as a tool for the army in the reign of Edward I. During his soirees in what we now call Wales, he came across people using a larger bow than average, but which, which had a good knockout rate. So he thought this would do well uh, for the armies that, that I want to have. Because bearing in mind his vision was to go off to France, where there was a dispute as to who was the, the king of France. And he knew his armies wouldn't be uh, as large or possibly as well equipped as some of the French ones. So he had to have something to combat it. And when he saw this and the power that it had, he figured out that he was a weapon relatively easy to produce, robust, with a good rate of fire, which would kill somebody at a distance and the, the same as the Dale Rifles, I suppose. So what he instigated was a program of, of getting this archery uh, going. So he ordered thousands and thousands of, of bows to be made, and they became very, very popular. Uh, we know about them in battles such as this Cressy, Agincourt, <coughs> Potier, and they, 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 they did well until such times this gunpowder uh, they came into being, and they then withdrew a bit, and people say they disappeared, but they didn't, because uh, the Mary Rose, yeah. Yeah, they found hundreds of them, yeah. 
The word that they like prefer to use was you, uh, uh, preferably if they could get it, uh, Spanish you, because Spanish you was a better quality. It was more pliable, more robust, and uh, it was the, 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 the master material uh, for a longbow. Uh, my son, who belongs to the English uh, War Bow Society, he has two U bows, and if you <coughs> look at them, you can see it's called quality counts. Uh, he wouldn't let me have them because normally, if you actually use a uh, pull a bow like that, it's yours. The wood, funny enough, is sensitive to touch, so people don't normally let other people play with their bows. I don't give tuppence personally because the trust bows my weapon, so people want to have a play with this uh, in a while, they certainly can. If you wasn't available, and we fell out of the Spanish and started burning the stuff, so they used it Italian you, we managed to fall out with them. <laughs> We've never fallen up with Europe before, have we? <laughs> <laughs> so other uh, pliable woods we use, ash, elm, and later on this one, which is hickory. It took about 60 hours of labour to make a top quality bow. A bow like this, um, one of the manufacturers told me, if he was uninterrupted and had the stay, if he didn't have to go down cutting trees, he could do this in about five or six hours. The quality obviously wouldn't be as good, but bearing in mind that most archers had their own bows and there was reserve stocks kept, those reserve stocks would not necessarily be the best uh, on offer. What really made this stand out from other of bows, other than the crossbow, was its penetrating power and distance. This bow here can go for about a hundred yards or so. This one can go for about 70 yards or so. The U bows that my son have can go for 250 yards. There is a knack to drawing these things. People think you've got to be as strong as an ox. A bit of strength does help. <coughs> but, the, uh, but, but the technique really is to use your whole body. Instead of just using your arms, you use, use your whole body. So when you keep the arm straight and then pull back, and normally you have a, a thumb on your mark where uh, you're on the cheek or your ear, depending on the length of the arrow, and you, and you lose it. It's like, I suppose, having a sight on a rifle in the way to go. So when you're moving it up and down, uh, you've got it at the same point of, uh, of, of contact and the arrow should go where you want it to go. It was designed to be a mass weapon. The idea being was to actually uh, intimidate the enemy by having thousands of these things firing at you at one time, as in some of the principal uh, the battles I've told you about. But the top uh, archers could easily hit somebody, an individual uh, marked out. The type of archers they had, there were two types of archers, one were called household or retain archers. These were the creme de la creme. <coughs> These were the top notch. These were the marksmen of the day. And they were hived off by either uh, the king or, or the nobility. And they were held in high regard. Uh, the Duke of Norfolk, uh, he actually, it's, it's on his, his records, on his accounts, that an archer called De, uh, Daniel, he paid a princely annual retainer of £10 a year, which was one heck of a lot of money in those days. And on top of his uh, sixpence a day fee, or whatever else, he provided a house for the family, and he provided gifts of kit and equipment. And if he did that for one of his household uh, archers, he'd do that for, all, uh, for a number of them. Uh, Warwick, the kingmaker, uh, Neville, the other Warwick, he said that one of his household archers was as good as three levied archers. Levied archers were people who worked in the community, but were archers, they were obliged to practice, 
uh, th their skill. And uh, if you know of a uh, street called the Butts, uh, anywhere, uh, the, that would be probably where they assembled after church on Sunday to practice their trade. But most would try and practice it as much as they could. Why? Because if they were no good, they'd die. <laughs> so it's a fair incentive to, to know your trade. But certainly the, the, the retained archers, they were capable of hitting a person. I know uh, my son and uh, his friend. They can have a, 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 a target uh, with some armor on and they can whack uh, into that. It's, uh, it, it's about 100 and 150 yards and yawn and get bored. But it takes a lot of practice and a lot of skill, obviously. The problem being is quite often your target wasn't uh, 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 in front of you for, for long enough. Once you draw your bow, you've got to load it, draw it, fire it. You cannot hold it like that. This is 40, 45 pounds. The minimum uh, a war bow would be with an 80 pound draw pull. Now, if some of you uh, uh, later on would like to have a go at pulling this, imagine having to pull twice poundage. You could see how you wouldn't have time to, to hold it. So that was the, that was the problem. The top class bowmen certainly could could, uh, could 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 hit the target at distance. So. Before I go on to cross, was anybody got any general questions? At what distance could it go through armour? I, I, I read somewhere at 100 yards, you could, it would go through armour, through the person's leg, out the other side, through the saddle, and that half an inch into the horse. Now, whether that's true or not, no. Well, there is a, a, um, a tale of the it was either Cressy or Potier, I think, where one French nobleman had been struck from the side on his horse. It went into his leg, into the horse, felled the horse with him on top of it. Now you have various type of arrows. I'm just trying to do with myself in this chief. <laughs> this one, you see, has a very fine point. So if the people coming towards you were lightly armed or even had chain mail as their principal form of defence, this would go straight into it. It is nasty, it is it is it, 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 it really is something that you ought to avoid if you're on the other side. If you're wearing armour, and armour can be plate armour, or like this fellow here, the, the equivalent of brigandine, which is strips of armour. If you imagine a, what you get on the, on, on the roof tiles and things like that, they overlap, <coughs> and, la uh, and later in medieval period, they're quite often preferred to plate armour. But nevertheless, plate armour, you had this they called the bodkin point, <coughs> and that was designed to penetrate plate armour. At the battles of <coughs> Cressy, Agincourt and Poitiers, this was going straight through the French armour. <coughs> It would penetrate to kill, probably, at a distance of uh, from 50 yards onwards. Otherwise, unless you got a one in the eye uh, or, or, or bare flesh, then it would wound. But certainly, when you get to the its 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 principal killing range, where the archers would then increase their rate to their most effective. You're talking about now 10 to 12 arrows a minute. That people coming at you then. That's when the damage was done, and that was it could come uh, through plate armour. There was a battle of Muron where the archers uh, uh, fired and found that the arrows were bouncing off. The uh, one of the principal European armour makers were from the Milan region, and they had discovered uh, uh, some armour which would combat these these arrows. So, what happens back to the drum board, better quality arrowheads were made. And as I said, these were used during the Wars of the Roses where plate armour 
was used extensively. Uh, it w that would have been used by Henry VIII, um, if, <laughs> if his ship hadn't sunk. Uh, so, you know, it's the old thing, I mean, even, even today, you have a, a, a weapon and somebody finds something which can negate it, so you find something else. It was much the same there. And you had these uh, other, other, other points. Well, I won't waffle long. You can come and have a look yourself. Excuse me. With the uh, Bodkin arrow, to penetrate armour, would it have to be direct fire, or would it penetrate armour if it was fired up in the air? I think it would probably have to be direct, because coming <coughs> down, because most of the armour by then wasn't flat, it was rounded in order to deflect, so it would have to be a straight on presentation. Certainly when Nigel, my son, does it on, 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 on armour, the armour is like that, and he's got to be straight on, and the arrow's got to be uh, 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 going straight and through in order to penetrate it. This was quite lethal in as much as if it went in, it would have a job getting the thing out. <coughs> And quite often the archers, when they were firing, they would have arrows stuck in the ground so they could just, they didn't have to keep taking them out of there. Did the um, winning side make a point of recovering their archers, their arrows afterwards? From yeah, the yeah, of the yeah, yeah, yeah. In actual fact, um, <laughs> during the Battle of Towton, uh, the, the chap in charge of the Yorkist book called Falkenberg, uh, he discerned uh, that the wind always blew in a certain direction, <laughs> at York as it was, <laughs> and what he did was he instructed his archers to have slight, uh, arrows slightly lighter in weight, and then when the armies were coming together to face each other, at the point where they would start the archery duel, he told his archers to dress back uh, 12 paces. Now when the uh, Lancastrian arrows came firing against the wind, they were hitting the ground and then the, the Yorkist arrow chasers would get them and would fire them back at them. <laughs> <laughs> so they get the top with, 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 with their own. Plus the fact the Yorkist arrows were, were, were going in and hitting the target. And that's where, why the, um, the, the Lancastrians moved from the more preferable ground because their casualty rate was, was getting too, too high to, uh, to, uh, to contain. So they moved and, and then they, they, they closed in and there was the fight. The archers at that point would probably, most of them, would probably have gone to the rear and started firing over the heads to try and, 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 and clobber the, the back end of the other <coughs> army. So, your longbow is certainly capable of being used as a sniper's weapon. The archers were good, they were skilled, but the target had to be there in front of them without interruption, and they had to be able to loose straight away. The other option was the crossbow. Crossbows started, as far as we know, somewhere in the region of 4 or 5 century BC, used by the what was now called Chinese states. They were always at war with each other. And they, we know that they used uh, crossbows. The bow itself would probably have been wood. And a lot of the other bits possibly wood uh, uh, with, with, with coated. Um, and that was the first time too that we heard of a weapon being actually uh, chosen as to, uh, to, to kill an individual uh, specifically and that was in uh, the uh, it was 1004 and the general called Shayold of Tainin sorry I'm not too good at Chinese my Chinese normally goes 38 with chips please <laughs> <laughs> but he was a, a, he was a general very good general he won nearly all of his battles so they decided he had to be taken out and they selected a, a crossbowman to, uh, to, to wait until they could get a, a shot at him, and he was killed. 
It was introduced into Europe, because the, the Greeks and the Romans uh, uh, had their versions too, by William the, Co uh, William the Conqueror. And it was a, an integral part of every European army. A professional crossbowman was regarded, uh, certainly in, in countries like Spain, uh, in, in, in the same light as a knight. They were highly respected and they were paid well. And they were paid well because of their skills and they were paid well because normally they had uh, an oppo with them. And that oppo used to carry their big shields, their pervasors, and their spare crossbow. And this crossbow, unfortunately, can only fire about two or three bolts a minute compared to the long bows. 10, 12, or even more per minute. So that was the downside to it. The upside was, of course, it could be held. Now, in medieval times, they went a lot on chivalry, or at least on the surface they did. And wars were seen basically as chess with armour on, quite often. Nobody wanted to kill too many people, ransom, <coughs> capture, ransom a few, but certainly in Italy and Spain and things like that, there was quite a lot of, of, of show and blow. And when they found out that some grubby oik who normally had a plough could be trained to use one of these and skewer a prince of the realm, this just wasn't cricket in medieval terms. So complaints were made, and, <laughs> and Pope Urban in the 11th century banned its use on Christian army against Christian armies and deemed it a weapon of the devil. It shouldn't be used. It was totally out of order. You could use it against the uncivilized Saracens, but you couldn't use it against fellow Christian armies. Suffice it to say, not a blind bit of notice was taken. <laughs> And, uh, uh, and Pope Clement, a century later, endorsed its, uh, its, its ban, use in Europe. Uh, and even the Magna Carta, section one of the Magna Carta, says that on its implementation, all foreign crossbowmen and their captains were to leave the country. No longer required, thank you very much. And of course, everybody took notice of that, didn't they? Compared to a longbow, this type, and these are the, the Rolls Royces, I suppose, of crossbows. This it was quite a complicated machine to make. A number of skills were required. You had to have the skill of a blacksmith to make the bow, <coughs> the lever, and the attachment here for it to go into. You would have to have a chippy carpenter to make the tillers. You had to have some uh, uh, a roper to make the type of rope that was needed at the, at the, uh, uh, the radius that was needed in order to suit. And then you had to have somebody skilled enough to put the lot together. So in comparison, the top notch uh, crossbow was expensive to me. Having said that in you, they didn't uh, mind spending out and in, they, in Genoa they produced companies of mercenary crossbowmen who were hired throughout Europe. Even uh, England, uh, they actually uh, they, 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 they took on crossbowmen. And before this, this was the, this was the weapon and it was, so, uh, it was so popular that they have specific factories, one in London and one in uh, St. Brevels in the Forest of Dean. And all they did was manufacture crossbow bolts. First of all, they just had the two fletchers, and then later on the third. And again, they could have be fitted with various types of, of bolt heads. This has a draw weight 
of about 60 or 70 pounds. But its problem is that all that stored energy only has a short distance to travel compared with the 28 to 32 inches that the longbow has. So therefore, <coughs> you've got to have a more powerful thing to compensate for the lack of, 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 uh, of energy produced. That will think I had to back up. <laughs> <laughs> this one here can fire, fire up to about, about 70 yards. Uh, that's what it, it did at Carefully Castle when I tested it out. And that was what you call a battlefield crossbow. The guys could be on the battlefield running around with that. It was easy, or fairly easy, to, uh, to respawn and fire. It was quite popular. Um, and the, the same lords who would want to have professional longbowmen in their retinues would also want to have a couple of these guys, the William Tells of the world. Now if anybody feels comfortable, I've got a grape in my pocket and it's just been put it sideways, I'll show you how good I am with the thing. <laughs> this one here, which is the one I would use, the draw weight on this is 260 pounds. So there, if it's got to have an apparatus in order for me to leave it, lever and pull it. <coughs> it can travel about 200, 200 yards or so. And that would be used in, uh, in, in circumstances like sieges or when you're in a defensive position, you've got your big shields there and you've got your number two behind it loading the things up. It's got a greater distance and so therefore you would uh, have it in a place where it was either a defensive position or used on the battlements. There was a third type which I haven't got and that has a, a draw weight of 900 pounds and can fire a, 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 a bolt somewhere in the region of four to five hundred yards and that's got to be cramped with what they call a windlass which is attached there fits on there and you wind it up and that really is I think those things would be normally used where you had a fair bit of cover because it takes a fair bit of time for us to crank the things up, then put the bolt in, and then aim it and fire it. But I've brought them here for you to see, and people can have a play with it later on. So when would you actually use this on a sniping thing? Well, let's leave the military side away and, and look at hunting. Anybody here who is into, uh, into deer stalking or anything like that, you will know that when you shoot a beast, it's best to shoot them in what you call the engine room, the heart and the lungs, in order to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to drop it. A crossbowman will go out with the huntsman to where the deer herds were. They do it all correctly downwind and possibly uh, uh, behind cover. Waiting for a beast to project the profile where you could actually hit the preferred target area. And the crossbowman would have his bow spanned, which is waiting for the beast to turn and then whack, out it goes. On the military side, it could be used on a number of, uh, for a number of reasons. One, the battlefield one. You have two armies facing each other and you have people who are just the ordinary soldiers, and then you have the officer ranks. And how would you distinguish? Well, if you saw somebody, and behind them there was a, a, a banner carrier with a pendant like this, 
you know he would be a knight. A knight would probably have squires, two or three men at arms, so you know he would be, uh, for the army amongst you, uh, the uh, a medieval version of section or platoon commander. So he would be worth having a crack at if all else failed. If you saw somebody with a banner <coughs> this shape, he would probably be a knight of baronet or company commander in, in military terms. He would have under his command a number of knights. He would also have a larger retinue of followers. So he is the prime target. Going on from him, and people knew their heraldry and who was who <coughs> these days, the next thing you have is the hierarchy of barons and earls. And this is... Uh, the banner of John Touche, who was sixth Baron Audley. They would be able to read who he was for a simple reason. This one here is the Audley coat of arms. This one here is the Touche coat of arms. And you know that that guy was probably the CEO because <laughs> he'd have knight bannerets and knights under him. So if you can take out the hierarchy, then you disrupt the, the enemy's uh, uh, a, a battle situation. They didn't mind if they only wounded them, for a simple reason. If they only wounded them, then their men, their retinues would want to get them off the battlefield. So you would lose not only the principal, but maybe 20, 30 or 40 key players on his side. What would happen? Was the Lord may say, see if you can get Lord Muck over there. And he would wait and wait and wait. He'd see the screen, his protective screen of his, of his retainers around him, and every now and again, you might see him. He'd probably be identified by a surcoat he was wearing, which would be the same as the banner. So the sniper, or the crossbowman, could just wait and wait and wait until there was a gap, and then, wham, the boat would go. You've heard of a saying, if you've had bad news and somebody says, was it expected? And you say, no, it was like a boat out of the blue. That's where the saying comes from. Because it just happens, whack. No warning. Man down. <laughs> I still remember the military train. They never point a weapon in the direction of people. <laughs> How fast would a boat go? Uh, it goes somewhere in the region about, depending on that weight, about, and the the, uh, the the poundage that was projecting it, I think somewhere in the region of about 20 yards a second, something like that. <coughs> Other uh, instances where it would be handy to have a sniper is in defence or attacking a, in the event of a siege. The most notable casualty struck by a, 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 a crossbow <coughs> sniper was Richard the Lionheart, Richard the I. He was killed during the siege of a pretty little fortified village. He went to see what was going on. The only crossbowman that there was, spotted him, obviously, even if he wasn't, wasn't in battle order, his band would be there, it was obvious who he was, and he was struck in the shoulder, um, he was badly wounded, uh, they couldn't get the boat out, gangrene set in, and he died a few days later. The castle <coughs> fell, or the village fell, and they, uh, the crossbowman was brought to Richard while he was still alive. 
and the guy expected the worst for some strange reason and Richard pardoned him he said you were only a soldier doing your job and I was stupid enough to make, it, make myself a target there was also uh, one or two notables in the Wars of the Roses Lord Scrub of, of Castle Bolton he was whacked by a crossbow when he exposed himself too much in the battle situation as the two sides were uh, moving to the inevitable uh, physical contact. Crossbows were also uh, handy <coughs> for trying to keep the heads of defenders down. In the siege of Rhodes, I think in the 4th century, crossbowmen were instructed to keep the heads of the defenders down while the guys tried to get their scaling ladders up and it was crossbowmen who were tasked to do that. The other bowmen would be firing their arrows obviously but the crossbowmen had the skill to find the gaps between the battlements. <coughs> In medieval times when you had sieges uh, there was a bit of caginess going on and certainly this type of crossbow and the, and the heavy one would be used in siege warfare. The problems could come, obviously, as, 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 as guys were advancing to try and, and scale or make advantage of breaches, and the defenders would be popping up in between the parapets and firing things at them. The lone bowmen would be trying to keep everybody's heads down anyhow, but the crossbowmen would be waiting until somebody who could do serious damage appeared. For example, throwing rocks or trying to tip boiling tar on guys trying to scale their ladders. Anybody who could pose a threat, the crossbowmen would be there and as soon as they appeared, whack a boat would go. Because they would know the defenders they couldn't hang about, just do what they had to do and get behind cover again. But the crossbowmen would wait and wait and wait patiently, I suppose like any sniper would, until such times as the opportunity presented itself and the way it would go the projectile. There would also, obviously, uh, on the opposing side of things, um, if you were defending, you would be looking through your arrow slits and you would be looking for principles commanders and you would want to try and take them out. You would also probably want to try and take out your opposite numbers on the other side if you saw that there was a, 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 an effective cross the ball man or two on, uh, on the other side you would try and wait until they pop their heads out behind their pervasors to have a shot and try and take them out. Also, you had the problems with the siege weapons, the trebuchets. These things were used to try and breach uh, the, the, the defences. They would chuck all sorts of things from these. You'd have rocks, you'd have uh, uh, flaming fireballs, you'd have diseased animals, unwanted mother-in-laws, all sorts of things. Anything would be would be hoiking your direction. Now if you could if you could stop their enterprise that would also be handy. They would probably have some form of, 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 of shield to try and protect them but actually if you could get almost square onto them you could see the operators loading and priming and get ready to go. So if you could take them out, these were the siege engineers, then you could, dis uh, you could disarm uh, one of those uh, engines, possibly forever, or until she sounds to find somebody else who knew what they were doing. So there was reasons for uh, having these weapons for sniping purposes. <coughs> what I would like to do now is say to you guys and ladies and gentlemen, if anybody has any questions, <coughs> would weather affect the longbow and crossbow, for example, in Raiden? The longbow, not too bad. You've heard this saying, you know, don't tell anybody to keep it under your hat. 
they reckon that that started in, in the Middle Ages. If it started raining, it'd be easy for the long bowmen to unstring their bows, shove them under their helmets, and wait for the rain to stop. Hemp is, 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 is used, and it's normally glued or waxed in order to, uh, 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 to help it. We've fired these things in rainy conditions, and they haven't, to be honest with you, had too much, not too much of a difference in performance. The problem is with these guys here. They do not like the rain. And with the best wind in the world, you can't unstring it. So you've got to shove it in some form of, of waterproof canvas bag and wait. So it is inoperable. And they reckoned on one or two of the battles which we fought, and they had Genoese crossbowmen uh, to combat uh, the longbowmen, that when it rained, the guys just about give up. Because if it rains hard, it really does affect the performance uh, of, of, of a crossbow. If it's light rain and you've got the thing um, <coughs> waxed, and I keep mine waxed, you can get away with it, but anything more than that, and certainly sustained rain of any type, is bad news for the crossbow. That's a good question. Thank you for it. Is the story of a two-fingered salute fact or fiction? <laughs> it depends which book you believe. <laughs> the idea being, as the gentleman has said, was the English longbowmen would taunt the French by going like that not the other way around, because they would be the draw fingers. And it was said that that some of the French noblemen, for a laugh instead of killing the archers, would chop off the two draw fingers so they couldn't do that. And they would cut them off either side, because some, uh, some archers were ambidextrous. And there was no second hand chops around in those days. Others say it's just a fable. Although I may look at it, I wasn't around at the time. <laughs> so I can't say what is true or not. What I can tell you, and I'm in select company here, and I hope it won't leave this room, it's a true story of the tragic accident of the Battle of Hastings. What happened was, can't, can't keep a straight face as you can tell, is Duke William, who was the first chiropodist we had in England, who was William the Corn Curer. <laughs> he was watching some of his, his soldiers being put through their paces to see if they were good enough for his army. And this chap comes up and he was an archer. Not a longbowman, obviously, it didn't happen, but, you know, a, 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 a woman. He said, OK, he said, there's your target. <coughs> Wide. Have another go. Wide. See, not much good, are you? He said, sorry, my lord, he said, I'm, I'm, I'm nervous you're watching me. He said, well, go five paces forward and try again. Wide, wide. He said, well, the best one in the world, he said, I can't take you. He said, you must, my lord, my, it's, it's a matter of honour. And of course, French and honour. Yeah, well, what is it? And he said that when Harold came over as a prince, then one of his men ravaged this guy's wife. It was a matter of honour he went into old English. He said, Right, but do me a favour. When the archery uh, duels uh, start, and when I ask them to commence uh, near when I think the English uh, uh, are going to be uh, the weakest, he said, fire up into the air, because the way you're going, you're going to have somebody's eye one of these days. <laughs> <laughs> and that is the, 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 obviously the true story, which you <laughs> will we'll believe. Can you say anything about the um, organisation they had for resupply of arrows? I mean, did the, the bowmen make their own and also have a squad of Fletchers, are they? Uh, uh, yeah, each, uh, before they went on campaign, the king would order masses of arrows to be made. Each archer would have with them someone the reason about 24. But they used to have uh, 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 runners who would be there to resupply if required. And these uh, would be kept uh, 
behind the, the, the lines, behind the men at arms, ready to be redistributed as necessary. They would also try and nick some of the enemies out of us as well if, if, if they could. No, but they were made en bulk and, uh, uh, and resupplied. Uh, the Battle of Cressy was that intense that they actually ran out of the resupplies. So what they did, they went to the king, who was sub, uh, suitably uh, uh, watching the uh, proceedings for all, a windmill, and said, we've got a problem, uh, the archers ain't got the arrows. So the uh, king ordered his own personal retinue archers, uh, reserve supply, to be sent down, and that more or less served the day. And instead of having white arrows like this, the king's uh, archers, fletchers, were red, apparently. But yes, they did supply. They also had resupplies of bows. Because even if you look after your boat, accidents happen. I was telling you there, um, uh, uh, two weeks ago, I was testing my long bows, and one snapped on me. I've had it for about nine or ten years, but it just snapped on me. It shouldn't have but it did. These things do happen. If it was a U, it wouldn't. This was, uh, uh, I think it was an elm bow, and it just, it just shattered. So I had to quickly uh, get a replacement so I could show you two made out of different types of wood. Also, if you'll notice that on the end here, this one has a bone end where the, uh, the string is, 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 is put into. This one doesn't. And both styles uh, were used. But bows and arrows, as well as crossbow bolts, yeah, ready supplies. <coughs> Normally the guy who was the purveyor's carrier for the, um, uh, 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 for the professional uh, crossbowman, he'd have the, the purveyor's stuck on his back for travel, and he'd have a box with all the spare bolts in, which he'd keep behind, and he'd reload, resupply. But even then, they would be more. As I said, they had two uh, manufacturing outlets in England making crossbow bolts every day of the, of, of the, work, of the working week. So there was always a resupply. How much do those bolts weigh, uh, the crossbow ones? Because in order to get the trajectory and the penetration, you want quite a bit of weight. weight. <coughs> Has the longbow a standard length? Sorry? Is the longbow made <coughs> to a standard length? Or not a standard length. Normally it's it's roughly the height of the guy using it. Roughly. <coughs> I'm six foot two. This is roughly it. You find that if you want to buy a longbow from a, a, a distributor, then they will send you a six foot one. But if somebody's six seven, they want one made, then they'll, 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 they'll make it to that. But thank you for the question. But the arrows, men in those days, in uh, early days, were only about five foot, weren't they? They were either 28 or 32 inches uh, long. The height of a man, a five foot bow. The arrows found on the Mary Rose, um, the shafts appear much thicker. They were, because they were very, this is what you might call the average shaft. The war bows, the elm war bows, their shafts would be uh, a, a fair bit thicker than this. And in respect of the crossbow bolts, they too could be thicker and heavier. The downside to having a heavier um, Longbow arrow is it does affect the range a little bit. Not the pictures you, you see of um, Agincourt, you, you, you see the archers firing up in the air. Yes. You're talking more of direct. Yeah. The, when you're firing up in the air at somebody who's, who's coming towards you on foot with armour, at the distance you first start, you are of nuisance value. Okay, you could get, uh, you could injure people, and even the authority. But 
it was really the nuisance, the, the fear of what might be happening, because they would know the reputation of the of the of the long woman was 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 quite horrendous, quite horrendous. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, you know, it's not something uh, they, they were doing lightly. And the poor souls at the front, once they got to about fifty yards away, and that's when they would change possibly their arrow heads and, or, uh, and also the, the weight of, of, of the arrow because at that distance would make a half the difference. The heavier it is with, uh, uh, with a bodkin point straight into the, in, into, the, into the target. And they wouldn't be looking to identify it, they'd just be giving it like that because it would have hit something. Am I right in thinking that the ratio of long bow to the crossbow was much greater. Yeah, I mean, a decent uh, longbowman would uh, his his best effort would be maybe about twelve a minute. The society I belong to, I shot crossbows and the guy shot the longbows, and we used to have time thing over three minutes. Now get about nine, and he could have nine hundred. So uh, that and. and uh, but that was the good point about the longbow. You could really drench people. And we weren't the first army to do that. Uh, the Turks, the Saracens, did it to us uh, during the Crusades. And their guys were, uh, uh, were, were mounted archers. Would you say something, please, about the relative accuracy of <coughs> the longbow arrow, which, my understanding, is spins? Yes. With a crossbow bolt, which some of the examples you've got there with just two feathers on them probably couldn't spin. I think the accuracy of the crossbow is greater than the longbow. In as much as you could hit a, 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 a target which may be, may be small, but the longbow if you had a large target, and some of the targets they used to practice with were man-sized with holes and then the black bit in the middle which they called the mark. And another saying comes from the medieval period, because they would be firing away at, at, at a distance and there'd be a guy there in the butts, <laughs> the medieval butts, and if it wasn't hitting the black he'd be going like that, which means you're wide of the mark. And the the and the article <coughs> adjust his aim accordingly. Can you, when you look at the old sort of Hollywood epics, uh, including uh, films about Ashen Corps uh, uh, and these huge set piece battles, the ranges you've mentioned are extremely short, seventy odd yards to penetrate mm. armour, um, hundred yards as being the limit of range. Well. Even with a lot of armour, it doesn't take a lot of time to cover that sort of ground. And if you've got some momentum going on a horse, you can probably cover that ground quite quickly. Could you sort of break down how the confrontation <coughs> would happen? I mean, where do your archers then go in relation to the guys who are going to have at them with battle axes and swords, men at arms? I mean, how does the organisation work uh, to get the full benefit from your archers? Right. When you saw the opposing army in its formation, you'd see if where their cavalry might be. So therefore you'd move your archers to confront them. They generally knew the tactics of the opposing army. They're boringly the same. So the archers each anyhow would have these defensive stakes which they would hammer into the, into the ground to give them some cover. They'd also have three pointed things called calthrops which they would throw on the ground, and they, those were the anti-personnel mines of the day. If you stood on one of those, or a horse did, you would be playing hop hopscotch for the rest of the battle. Um, when the men-at-arms were coming, I think at Agincourt, uh, people are arguing about what the formation of the, British Ar of the English army was. Nobody really knows, because there is no official um, um, record. But what we do know is that the French Marshal and Constable of France said they wanted to 
hover their army uh, to mirror what the English always did. And they had the crossbowmen on the flanks. They had their uh, their men at arms, knights and nobles, in battle orders in the centre. And their aim was for light cavalry to get round the back and sides of the English archers so they wouldn't have to confront them head on. It went pear shaped when Henry, uh, Henry moved his men and, and the French cavalry uh, uh, moved and they found they couldn't get round so they were driven in towards where the archers were. And the archers would go straight for the horses. They wouldn't be bothered about the men because you can mess a horse up and you know, problems. So they'd be uh, uh, messing the, the horses up. Behind the archers would be your bill men and, and, and your fighting men at arms, as you say. And when it got too close to come, the archers withdraw, and then your men at arms would, would take over the scrap. I think what happened was uh, that, uh, in common <coughs> with a lot of the tactics of the day, that the English archers had a line of archers in front of their main battle, but also a large number on the flanks because they were so skilled they could adapt their formations to suit the battle. And I think that there was a, 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 a number of archers who would take the, the French full on. And we know that this must have been so because the French then moved, instead of line, they moved into columns to re re reduce the frontage. By that time, uh, the French cavalry had taken the pasting so that the archers on the flanks then turned inwards and hit them like that, so they then moved again. And uh, moving in armour, uh, and I have a full harness, I tell you what, you do 15 hours, you're being cracking, you really, you, you really are. And at Agincourt, places like Crassy, if it was wet ground, muddy ground, it'd be slipping and sliding, it would be, there would be no sprint there, it would be, the, 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 they would be slow to move. And I think that's how they got rounded. The Lumberbone were very, very adaptable, and their captains could read a battle and adjust their manpower accordingly. Um, <clears throat> just a comment, really. I went to Jamestown Settlement in Virginia, and I was talking to the armourer there, and I said, you know, I assume they didn't trade muskets with the natives. And he said, oh, yes, we did. They would trade muskets with the natives, but they wouldn't tell them how to maintain them. <laughs> so they'd go rusty and be useless after a few weeks. Mm -hmm. He said the one thing that was banned from the settlements on the eastern seaboard were longbows, mm -hmm. because that was a technology that the Native Americans understood <coughs> and yeah. would have made them far more lethal. There's also that a lot of these, for example, when they make these crossbows for Geordies. There's a sign in here which it says, hold the other end. <laughs> 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 Could you talk about the relative times it took to train a longbowman and a crossbowman? Longbowman, five, six, seven. Normally the son of a longbowman, he'd have this shoved in his hand and that would be his toy. And he would shoot at all sorts of things and get encouragement from his dad. As he grew, the bows would get longer, harder to use, so they were, they were weaned on it. You, uh, talking to the professional bowman that I know, my son is one of them, he says, you are never, ever good enough. And you always <coughs> must practice your skills. Uh, if you don't uh, use it, you lose it. So the answer is, from an early age, upwards, and they never stopped learning. Never stopped learning at all. Crossbowman, well, if you have the cheapest type of crossbowman, you can see this is what you do, point it in that direction and go like that. Mm. So you can train somebody in a very, very short space of time, within a few hours, to shoot the thing. That's <coughs> why they objected and have the things banned, you know, because the common oik was knocking out uh, royalty and nobility. Mm. But the professional would be a different ball game. He would practice his skill, practice his skill, practice his skill. Because most of the actual <coughs> aiming was hand-eye coordination. And they would know their bow, and they would get used to it, the way it, it handled, and they'd be able to do just like that. Longbowmen would have all sorts of targets. I've mentioned the 
uh, the large one, but the Sundowners used to have square ones, which would have about 50 or 60 paces away. You now try and hit that. And the reason for that is, if you look at that, and then look up at the battlements, the same type of, 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 of area to look at, and that's how they would practice uh, 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 trying to get in the, in, into small spaces for one of a better way. But as has been rightly mentioned, uh, the arrows twizzle a bit, so therefore as they go, they use, lose that, that, that amount of accuracy that this crossbow bolt uh, probably would. You drew an analogy earlier on to deer hunting, mm -hmm. and in kind of firearms and ballistics, it's a combination <coughs> of the muzzle velocity and the weight of the bullet, the projectile, mm -hmm. yeah. um, that will cause death. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sometimes, irrespective of whether you, you hit a vital spot or not, there's so much energy in that missile that that can be enough yeah. to cause death. It seems to me that if you have a crossbow which has a 900 pound pull at certainly the short to medium ranges of that, you would say that would almost certainly be fatal to a person if they were hit by a bolt. Mm -hmm. is, is that a conclusion to draw. If they were hit by a, a, a bolt, I would think it, certainly at the greater distance, it, it, it probably wouldn't be fatal. Uh, but as you got to the 900 pounder, as you got to within about uh, 500 yards, that's when you would start working. Because there would be a heavier bolt, yeah. a much heavier bolt. Because uh, it needed to keep its accuracy for the long, for the, for long, for the longer distances. And certainly, when we've done sieges, when we've had targets up in, in towers and things like that, they tend to use the the heavier bolt in order to get the effect. It would be only the the what I would call the, the minimum power uh, field crossbow that would use use for hunting. Would hope to get near enough in order to hit the base so we wouldn't go looking for cover and be able to travel distances because yeah. then they would have to send the dogs and you know and the other beasts which they might want to take with a with, with do a runner. Robert Hardy uh, had a program on the, the longbow yeah. and I think he, he used um, the carcasses of pigs yeah. to show just how effective the arrow from the longer. Mm -hmm. I mean, it could really penetrate the carcass. Uh, that's right, because they reckon the carcass of a pig is very similar to a human. To, to a human. Mm -hmm. Sitting out of the military policeman will call pigs, you know, so that must be right. You know? <laughs> <laughs> For those who aren't familiar, the, every year, I think it's the second week in May, you can see the longbow being fired by the annual meeting of the uh, Southern Archers on the Green Jackets Field in St. Cross. Uh, their first day, their Tuesday, is always the day when they have the longbows out <coughs> and then they have the more tactical uh, equipment later in the week. So it's always a wonderful opportunity to see them uh, on the bus. I never knew that, thank you very much indeed. <coughs> I'm aware that... Can you just say something about how... When did they string the bows before a battle? You know, how far in advance did they string them? And with the arrows, we talked about them putting them in the ground yeah. in front of them, which... Um, will cause septicemia if you hit somebody. So, you know, what's a, was that what they actually did? Have them stuck in the ground in front of them so they could fire them more quickly? For, for the, so they could fire more quickly because they could bend, bring it up, fire, bend, bring it up, fire. No health and safety there. You know, you can only hit people with a clean arm ahead or you could do big damage. <laughs> and as regards to uh, when they would string the balls, they would string the balls just before they went into formation. That's when they would string them. Would they do it on an order? Or <coughs> they would do it naturally. They, they, they just get into position, string the ball, talk about the weather, and uh, wait for the orders to come. I challenge anybody here to string one of these. Yeah. I tried with the child's bow and I couldn't string that. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas David just did it straight off. But if I don't find his hands in my Right, any more questions from anybody? Yes. I just like, um, fire arrows and bolts, is that a Hollywood myth or did they actually... They fire arrows, yeah. I haven't got one, but there is like an arrowhead and it's, 
it 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 it, it, it sticks out, and you can put uh, material in, uh, which which like, and they would do that really if they knew there was thatched roofs um, <laughs> in the in the in the in the townships. When Henry V decided he was going to uh, attack the the the, 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 the France and take his rightful crown. One of the first things he did before they even set off was he had he had people going off to Calais to actually uh, take away all the thatched roofs and tile them because he feared fire arrows going over. Maybe not to the longbow, but how do you fire a Parvian shot? A Parvian shot. Yes. If it's a shot, shot that I'm thinking is. Is uh, if you if they were on a horse, they would be able to turn round, and the horse would be heading in this direction, and you could turn and and, and fire your, your, your shot. I think the idea was the the horses galloped away, which gave the impression that you were retreating. So you broke your formation, and the bowmen on the horse would turn round mm -hmm. and fire back. But that wouldn't, that wouldn't be with. They were actually they were actually trained to fire three arrows in a charge, so you fired yeah. one coming forward. Yeah. And then these were compound bows with a phenomenal performance. Mm. They fired one on the advance, one as they turned, so they'd be firing that, and then the parking shot was as they went back. So there'd be three arrows. Every horseman would fire three arrows, and each of those arrows were capable of going a couple of hundred yards. So I mean, it was a, it, it was a devastating weapon. Yeah, as the Crusaders found out, and the Romans did. So the young gentleman. Um, was there any attempt by the French to adopt the longbow technology? Yeah. It just and why they failed the training issue? No, they did. They did they said, well, we've got some of this, but they just couldn't get it together. I think right. it's the old stubborn brick mentality. Mm. Wasn't it Henry VIII um, football? <coughs> to yes. encourage it. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It was illegal for him. What about the fact that um, when they found dead people back in, you know, like corpses from 200 years, that their body was bent slightly. And it was put down to the fact that. <coughs> As I say, when you have a, a, a war ball, you use your whole body. You have your. And then you pull back, but you use your whole body, and not just this arm. So your body is moving the thing. But it's hard thing. If you do it enough times, you if you do it, if you, body, yeah. If you do it often enough, then you get a, 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 a deformation. Curvature of the spine. Yeah, 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 yeah. And also, um, you, you can do, you do damage to your yeah, shoulders. Get shirt off then, Dave. Was it compulsory um, for the? Peasants and villains or serfs to practice on some yes, the, the levied the levied archers, uh, as you say, from the community, they would oblige, like it or not, to certainly practice formally every Sunday. But we know that a lot of them practiced in spare time anyhow, because they knew that come the day, come the hour, their efficiency could save the lives of themselves and the and, and the comrades. It was in their interests to be proficient, but no, there, there was formal formal training. I mean, the retained household archers could train almost every day, but one of the incentives for them to stay sweet was if they'd had a, a, a trade, like a, a stonemason or a chippy, then so many days a month they could go and do that unless they were needed, and they would earn their wages, and that would supplement their archers' wages. But what about the ordinary people? People had nothing. I mean, <laughs> they were used as well. Obviously, they couldn't. You couldn't just have the gentry and the upper classes firing that. Yeah. Are, you they, talk, you are, are you talking about? I'm talking about the cannon fodder, as it were. You know, the ordinary serfs and the, were they forced to practice? Yeah, every, uh, everybody who everybody, everybody was w w was forced to be proficient. Yeah, and I think uh, <coughs> I, I think that the the, the folks who the yeah. But certainly, if anybody wants to come and pick up a toy and have a go, I brought uh, the archer sword, which is a falchion, and the type of sword which would retain um, a crossbow and would have just something else, and some of the leg armour that 
retained uh, 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 Archer uh, uh, would have. Right, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'll invite you, I find that fascinating. Was in Dover, uh, there was uh, an organization called the Black Princes uh, Company, uh, and they talked about uh, longbowmen and archery competitions and how a really highly trained longbowman had to put 10 arrows into a gold at 100 meters, I think it was, uh, and they had to do that within a minute. And if they could do that, then they became you know, the, the top-ranking archer. Um, that is uh, really quite a skill. And I didn't mind you, but I sort of look at these pictures and I think, Waterloo must have been terrifying, but actually, facing a whole load of um, yes. British archers going after you or <coughs> taking their trousers off and mooning at you, and knowing that they had the arrows stuck in the ground, and if you were hit by one of them, you were going to get septicemia or something worse, I think would have been more terrifying. You could actually see the enemy. Unlike today, when you go on the battlefield, and whereas these people would have been terrified by the fact that they got killed without knowing who had fired at them, uh, the battlefield was absolutely empty. And it would be more terrifying for us these days, I think, to face somebody right close up, as they had to do in those days. But um, Dave, thank you very much indeed. Do come up, as David said, and have a look at the longbows. Um, try stringing one. I couldn't even string the child's one. <coughs> but um, the ladies may be able to do it, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, um, come up and have a look. Drinks and, uh, and nibbles outside. Thank you very much for coming along, and thank you, David.